Shalom, my name is Brother Dawa Bay in Israel, and I am the host of the Yah is Real Hour. And the title of this show today is going to be What's Going On? Uh, we're going to be talking about the situation uh, in the schools, what's going on with our children. I have a brother here, a guest, who uh, flew in all the way from Philly, uh, Dr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. He's a nationally known psychologist. He's here with me today. I want to welcome the brother. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Chicago, which appreciate it, brother. So uh, this is a live call-in show. So the number that we could be reached at is 312-738-1845. 312-738-1845. So I want the doc, without further ado, I want the doc to go ahead and tell a little bit about itself. Uh, I am a nationally certified school psychologist. And my job is to decide which children goes into special education. School psychology is a certain type of psychology. When most people think of psychology, they think of clinical psychology, which we'll probably talk about a little bit as we go into the ADHD and the psychotropic drug movement against black boys. But a school psychologist is unique because we work in the schools. And we don't primarily do therapy, although many of us are trained to. Our job is to decide who has the learning disability who is retarded, who is emotionally disturbed, who needs special education. So it is special ed law that basically provides a job for school psychologists. And special education has a unique history that grows out of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. In 1954, when the Supreme Court said that race no longer could be used as a factor in education, white supremacy had to come up with a new strategy to resegregate black from white. So 21 years later, special education was born mm -hmm. in 1975. There was no special education in America, not on the federal level, until 1975. And it is not by coincidence that special education comes right after the Civil Rights Act when forced integration of schools was supported by the federal government or forced by the federal government. So special ed became necessary. So we can no longer keep black kids from white kids because they were black. We would now just say that they have a learning disability. Wow. You know, I noticed when I was in school, in high school in Michigan, I noticed that most of the people or the children that were in special ed was boys, men, yes. males. Yes. Now, what's going on? with that? Is there a connection there? Oh, without a doubt. Whenever you want to miseducate a population, special education becomes the direct route. And there's no population in America that is as marginalized as the black boy or the black male. And in fact, in my position, there are basically five stages of extermination that this society has developed to deal effectively with black men. The first stage is miseducation, the school itself. Without miseducation, there's no such thing as jail. Without miseducation, there's no such thing as economic castration. Without miseducation, there is no wholesale homicide. Okay, miseducation is essential in order for oppression to really deal with the black male problem that they have here in America. Miseducation has three primary components. Number one, to teach the black boy to hate himself. Number two, to teach the black boy to love white people. And number three, to effeminize and, if possible, homosexualize the black boy. Those are the three main goals of education. Teaching of self-hate, teaching of white love, and to effeminize or homosexualize the black male, which means to break his spirit. And one of the reasons why so many of our boys drop out of school is because the way they are treated. I always say there's no such thing as a black male dropout rate. There's only a black male push-out rate. Our boys are pushed out of school by the treatment they get from a predominant female teacher base and a predominantly white female teacher base. You have to understand, public education is the coming together of middle class white women and poor black boys. Middle class white women and poor black boys. 
two populations that this society, for most of its history, has tried to keep apart. So a white woman generally has a fear and a contempt for the black male. How can you teach someone if you fear him or hate him or is not safe in his company? So if we want to improve the education of black boys, then they're going to have to be taught by black men. Damn. Man, that sounds excellent. Excellent. I totally agree. You know, I, I myself have a vision or visualize myself being in charge of some type of school. And, but, you know, it's like, where is the funding at? Where is the funding for a brother? Is there any funding out there for a brother that wanted to do something on a revolutionary level? I don't want to deal with no crackers, period. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. just want to deal with our own students and get their mind back to, uh, back to where it's supposed to be. Because all that self-hate, man, is ridiculous stuff that we got out here. Exactly. There's basically four types of schools you can have. You can have a religious institution, a public school, a charter school, or a private school. Now, religious schools are the most free of all of those four types I just named. Okay, if you have a religious school, then the oversight by the State Department of Education is minimal because it's religious. They have the most power in terms of educating their own. Public schools and charter schools, which are a form of public schools, constant oversight. Okay? Private schools which is like what your brother Marcus Klein is doing here in Chicago. That's the best route to go because a private school, for many intents and purposes, is almost like an independent country. You get to set your own laws. Now, there's certain federal and state mandates you have to follow, but you have a lot more control over the day-to-day -day operation of your school. And I think as a community, we have to look at private schools to properly educate our black boys. There's no way we can leave them in public schools and charter schools and expect them to be the type of men we need them to be. The primary goal of public education is to socialize. The primary goal of education is to socialize. I always say that your son probably can't read, but he knows the Pledge of Allegiance. Can't write his name, but he knows the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, can't do math, but he knows who George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln was, although all three of them were anti-African presidents. So the purpose of public education is to socialize. And that is one of the biggest reasons why we have this great homosexual threat, because now, as a population control measure, they are socializing black children to be lesbian and homosexual as a strategy to reduce the birth rate in the black community. Homosexuality is not being pushed as a cultural revolution. Homosexuality is being pushed as black population control to convince an entire generation of black children to have sex with people of like gender. Why? Because if I can convince black boys to cohabitate with black boys, and if I can convince black girls to cohabitate with black girls, then what do I do to the black population rate, the birth rate? I cut it in half. Same thing with prison. The mass incarceration of black men, which is a function of miseducation, is being done to control the black population rate. When a black male is incarcerated, and when he is incarcerated during his prime years, from about 18 until 38, then what you are also doing is not only incarcerating him, but you are incarcerating the two babies that he would have had had he not been incarcerated. Oh. Everything that's done must be viewed as a population control strategy. Everything that's done is population control. Even when you look at the welfare laws that were put into effect in the black community, many of them forced okay, the woman to separate from the man in order to get certain types of assistance. Everything is about controlling our numbers. So whether it's AIDS, whether it's Ebola, whether it's special ed, whether it's Ritalin, whether it's jail, whether it's homosexuality, everything is about exterminating the black gene. Eugenics means the extermination of the black gene. Not the poor black gene or the rich black gene. Not the light-skinned black gene or the dark-skinned black gene. Not the educated black gene or the uneducated black gene. It is about the extermination of all of us, which is why bourgeois, elitist, middle-class Negroes have the wrong idea, because many of them believe that if they accommodate the system, the system will spare them. Yes, the system will spare them until the end because they need them in order to exterminate the masses. But once the masses are exterminated, you can best believe that the elitist clique is next to follow. White supremacy does not put black people in groups. It is for the extermination of all of us. Well said, my brother. We got any callers on the line? Yeah, how you doing? Shalom. Shalom, brother. Go ahead. Yeah, how do you feel about Mel Daly and uh, George Wee Neighbors? <laughs> and these police get what they discern. And y'all have not seen them. 
Thanks, brother. Uh, we're not really talking about Mayor Daly right now, but uh, as far as uh, him leaving and going off, whatever he's doing, I, you know, that's, that's his business. But I want to say this. We do need a mayor, a different type of mayor. So maybe I'll run for mayor. How about that? Let's call it. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, brother. I'm listening. Go ahead. You on there? Hello? Go ahead. I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm on or not. Yeah, you on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm on. All right. right. Okay. Um, this brother here is one of the coldest brothers I've seen on TV in a long time. And uh, I could understand where you um coming from with the education. But a lot of this miseducation started not only in the schools but in our religion. You know, we've been miseducated all the way around. Everything that we think we know, we really don't know. And um, I'm trying to figure out what can this brother do in order to try to bring out more of everything because basically we're enslaved um, educationally. I agree with you. I agree with you. I also believe that the religious institutions have a lot to do with how we've gotten in the condition that we're in, but I also think that they have a lot to do with why we stay in the condition that we're in. For example, when you look at most inner cities, you have churches, masjids, and religious temples on almost every corner. But if you were to do a survey to find out how many of those religious institutions offer a free academic enrichment program to African-American children who have delayed skills, almost none of them do. And the ones that do, they only do it because they get grant money from the local, state, or federal government to do that. Unfortunately, our religious institutions have, are just as selfish as individual black people have become, and they're not really interested in helping our children unless someone's going to give them money for it. It bothers me how we can have children in, on, in church on Sunday learning about Jesus, but yet they can't even read Jesus in the Bible. Or children who go to the mosque on Friday learning about Muhammad, but they can't even read his name in the Quran. My point to the religious institutions, and I don't have a problem with religion, I don't see anything wrong with them. In fact, sometimes they can be a benefit. Okay, they can be a benefit, but religion is neutral. Any institution is neutral. It's how it's used. Religion was used to help fight for the end of slavery, but religion today is being used to re-enslave the African mind. So the problem with religion is that its scope is limited. It's no longer what it used to be to the community. A hundred years ago, you could go to the church in order to get a job. You can go to the church if you had social issues. You can go to the church if you had run-ins with the law and if your rights were impeded upon. Unfortunately, today, the church is only prepared with helping black people get ready for heaven, but they're totally content with allowing black people to exist in political hell every day. Mm. Great. Well said, brother. Next caller. Uh, yes, uh, Brother Dawa. Shalom. Shalom, sir. Uh, I just want to thank you for this beautiful brother you have brought on. It's way overdue, brother. I just thank you so much for your great knowledge and your inspiration, your integrity. Uh, I prayed for someone like you, and you have finally came to Chicago. I would just like to touch on religion. I agree with you 100 uh, percent. I have nothing against uh, different organizations that got religion, but I think they are one of the main causes why our black people are held down because they go over the same lessons every Sunday, every Sabbath. They don't teach the black people about moral issues. Uh, a lot of black people have mental issues. We do not know how to treat each other. We are a bigger oppressor than almost the white man is. So i just like to ask you, uh, why have we became so caught up in money instead of kindness and being spiritual? We have made money our God. Everything is focused on money. Nothing is uh, focused on commitment and love and teaching our black children about how to be moral citizens. All we teach them is how to get money, how to get materialistic things, and I think that is one of our biggest problems. We need to go back to the basics. The black woman needs to stand up and start 
encouraging the black man to do the right thing and to make him make that U-turn and to start really encouraging him. In Jeremiah 31, 22, it said it'll come a time when a woman shall surpass a man. That only meant that he would give woman great knowledge and great substance to help her black man to start being strong and let him be a leader like Deborah did. She had to encourage her husband, go out there, fight that war. I'm going to show you how to get these people. We need more black women to start really being committed to the righteous black man so we can get things back together in our community. Thank you so much, brother. And please, could I have your information? Shalom. Uh, thank you for that, sister. Well, first, Brother Dawa and I want to invite everybody, everyone out uh, this afternoon from 12 until 3. We have some that busy signal. Should I continue to... Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. From 12 until 3 this afternoon at uh, Brother Marcus Klein School, the uh, Freedom Home Academy, I'm going to be doing a free workshop for the African-American community on special ed law, discipline, procedure, and other things that are important for you to know. That's this afternoon, right after the show, from 12 p.m. until 3 p.m., and I believe the Freedom Home Academy is located at 8100, 8100 South, South Dante, D-A-N-T-E. Right, D -A -N -T -E. right. Okay, so please come on out. Children are welcome. Again, Freedom Home Academy today, 12 to 3, no cost. Please come on out. But, sister, one thing we got to understand, and I totally agree with your comments, whenever you want to control a people, there's three institutions that are absolutely necessary to control and dominate any people. Number one, you must control the school. Number two, you must control the church. And number three, you must control the military. Those are the three most important institutions in any community. So when you look at the black community, obviously, we don't have our own community police force. So that's totally controlled by Europeans. Then when you look at the church, that's also totally controlled by Europeans. We tend to look at the mosque and look at the church and say that these are black institutions. No, they're not. The process the mindset, the ideology is totally European. We don't have an African-centered form of Islam, and we don't have an African-centered form of Christianity. We got European and Arab forms of religion that are simply being managed by black personalities. Religion is the most political institution in the black community. It always has been. When slavery began, it was done through the church. When the missionaries came into Africa to subdue and colonize, they did it through the church. Whenever the enemy wants to get a stronghold in the black community, they call up the clergy. They call up the imams. They call up other religious leaders who they know will push forward their program. There is nothing non-religious about the church. The church and the mosque are totally religious. And in fact, one of the reasons why black people are being so successfully oppressed and subdued in this country is because many of the people who stand at the pulpit are afraid. They are afraid to do the work that they claim they were sent here by God to carry out. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, see, we got a heavyweight here. Uh, go ahead, next caller. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. You're on there. Uh, I totally agree. I'm a mother, a single mother. I have a 13-year-old son. And I notice in the school, a lot of the boys are homosexual. He tells me that. And also, the women always uh, complain about little bitty things about my son. And another thing, going back to church, you see we had a talk show about tax and offering, how uh, it's not money, it's considered food. Bring your... Uh, uh, to the storehouse, but a lot of pastors and everyone don't believe that tithes and offering is not money. So when you go to these churches, what turned me off, sitting there when they ask for money, pay your tithes and offering. God, you sure change your God, robbing God, how? And tithes and offering. So when I sit there, that's a total turn off. You did that show about five years ago. Right. And uh, I talked to a lot of my friends about it. They're not trying to hear it. So... There you go. But I just wanted to thank you for having me talk show, and it helps a lot. And you're right. The community, the black community, is pitiful. It's sad. The uh, religious institution, the uh, education institution, is miseducation of the black boy. So I agree totally. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank sister. you. As far as homosexuality goes, we have to understand that the movement to homosexualize black children, and particularly the males, began in 1972. The Rockefeller World Population Council, along with Planned Parenthood International, and yes, I'm talking about the same Planned Parenthood that was started by eugenicist Margaret Singer to open up abortion clinics near the black community to reduce the black population. 85% of all Planned Parenthood abortion centers are located in satellite areas adjacent to the black community. In fact, it's been estimated that since the birth of Planned Parenthood in the 1900s, that black people have exterminated more than three million of their own children. When we hear these conversations about Hispanics taking over as the largest ethnic group, that's only because Hispanics tend not to kill their children as much as black people do. And the reason why we kill our children so often is because of the self-hate. But getting back to homosexuality, the Rockefeller World Population Council and Planned Parenthood decided that homosexuality must no longer be viewed as a mental disorder. Up until 1972, homosexuality was listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That's the Bible of psychology and psychiatry. Everything we diagnose is in that book. And if you are a parent, you should have a copy of it. You can get it at any bookstore. It's a little silver book with blue letters, DSM-4, okay? And what they decided was that had to come out. Up until 1972, homosexuality was a mental disorder. At the American Psychiatric Convention in 72 or 73, the homosexuals were able to uh, infiltrate the movement and was able to encourage the psychiatrists to vote to remove homosexuality from the list. So homosexuality has only been normal in America for about 35 years. Once they decided that homosexuality would no longer be abnormal, it was then decided that it would be pushed into the black public schools to control our population. In fact, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger in 1974, look at the dates, 72, Rockefeller World Population Council and Planned Parenthood said we got to change things. 73, they take it out of the DSM. It's no longer abnormal behavior. 74, Henry Kissinger in a national security memorandum said that we should consider, we should consider homosexuality as a population control strategy in the black community. And that is right now, that's one of the reasons why President Obama's Secretary of Education from Chicago, Arnie Duncan, is a supporter of homosexuality. In fact, the person who President Obama appointed as the safe schools and drug-free schools are right now, wants a mandatory kindergarten through 12th grade homosexual curriculum in every public school in America. Now, we know that homosexuality has roots in Greco-Roman philosophy and culture. Oh, Many dear. of the Greek philosophers were homosexual. Many of the Roman philosophers were homosexual. Julius Caesar was homosexual. Napoleon was a homosexual. Most white psychologists teach that homosexuality is a natural adolescent male behavior, which is why I always encourage black parents, do not send your son to a white therapist or a black one unless you know their sexual orientation because many of our children are getting psychotherapy from homosexuals who are propagating the lifestyle. Homosexuality is being pushed to exterminate the community. They make the boys gay, they inject them with HIV, they inject it into our sisters while, they get, while they're cohabitating and that is why HIV is the number one killer of black women on the face of the earth. They're giving AIDS to the gay men and we're giving it to our queens. Black population control. Man. <laughs> Caller, go ahead, Caller. Hello? Go ahead. Yes, I, I have actually two, I have two comments. First, I want to say that I travel like to HBCU every week, and I see so many gay students that it's just amazing to me. So I <sighs> absolutely agree that what you're saying, we are seeing the results of that because I have never seen this many gay children, not just men, but women. Like, I'm actually confused. I don't know if it's a girl or a guy. That's how much. And this is like seeing thousands and thousands of black kids between the ages of 18 and 24 every single week. So I absolutely agree with that. 
And the other comment I have to make is that in regards to religion, I was on a plane, I was talking to this guy, and he was saying how, you know, well, we're in India, he was Indian, and he was saying how they had been enslaved and how they've been, you know, they've been colonized and they had all these same problems with under white rule and everything like that. But, I'm, but his religion, Hinduism, carried him generations and generations through this struggle. And so he kind of was dismissive when I was talking about how black people in America, how what we've been through is very unique. It's different from any other people on this earth. And I was like, well, the difference is that why our religion wasn't able to carry us through this time is because it's not our religion. Somebody took us from someplace, and we didn't have anything. So that's why, maybe that's why it's the difference. So don't just be dismissive about, like, what our struggle is, and, you know, comparing to Indians. Like, it's a very, very unique Thing and dehumanizing thing that we went through. So that's all I have to say. And I appreciate your show, and I'll keep watching. Peace. Thank you, thank you. Hold on, hold on, Doc. Holy comment. Uh, next call. I want to get some more callers, and they, they, the lines is tight. Go ahead. Go ahead, caller. Hello? Yes. Oh, can, is it? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Go ahead, Ryan. Okay, this is uh, this is Black Rose here. Ryan, you doing, sis? Okay, you know something? I do. The, uh, the callers need to listen to this too. It's very important, especially women. You don't supposed to. I mean, I didn't grow up like that. You don't beat women. Don't are supposed to be beating on little boys. I think that is the worst thing. I mean, my my grandmother uh, didn't do that. She taught my father. You don't hit. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. She didn't hit the boys. My father chastised the man. Man. Pinching and hitting. I see that a lot on the buses and women cursing, cursing that boy. You make them resent you. You're supposed to nourish the male child in the right perspective. I've never beat. I don't beat my. I've never did that. And I don't believe in it. I, I, I believe in the old school grandmother. My grandmother taught me that. Right. And I see it. And I see it's wrong. It makes them, it makes them very much rebel and make them hate women. Right. Make them hate you when you do that, when you're beating and pecking those little, little boys and, 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 call, and cursing at them. They look at it. I, cause if they could just see how the sons, how their sons look at them. I, I watched that. I said, isn't this? I said, oh, man. I said, they don't know what they're doing. I asked one woman. I told one lady I saw a pinch of sun, and he, was, he hurt him so bad he was on his tiptoes. She, he said, uh, she said, uh, she was cursing at him. I said, miss, please don't do that. I said, do, you don't know what you're doing. She told me to mind my damn business. Mm. But see, she gonna she got something coming. She just don't know. Women, yes, I, I agree with the other sister. And I've always told men, I want to talk about this a lot. They don't respect their men. They don't respect the black man at all. It's nothing too bad for them to say. They call them bees and whores. They, that's how they talk to the men now. I, I hear it on the street. And I hear it in the building where I live. The black woman has no kind of respect for the black man at all. And she will get him hurt. Right. I know that for sure. She will definitely. And the brother here sitting here, oh, man, you know what? <laughs> you hand it down. <laughs> That's why we have to talk. I love this brother here. Oh, man. Same this is, here. This is our type of brother here. Oh, same man. Same here. Same here. Same here. Now. <laughs> That's, all. That's all I got to say. I'm gone. <laughs> all right, Rose. Thanks. Now, we're going to take an intermission here. I want you to uh, put that information back up uh, about the meeting that we're going to have. Uh, Jose, take care of that for me. Put that, put that information back up. We're going to take a brief, maybe three, four minutes, five minutes, or what have you. Uh, you can put that song in again, number four. Let that play while we take a brief uh, in, intermission. Right back, right back. Is anybody listening? Mm -hmm. I wonder, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. A voice in the wilderness. Uh -huh. I wonder, can you see me? Trouble is on the land. Every man against every man Sister, I wonder, can you stand? 
come here and take my hand Grab the babies and give my gun Mm-hmm Boy, in the street is on its own Mm-hmm So, Bob, real quick, real quick Mm-hmm Put down a glass I'm puffin' on your cigarettes Mm-hmm Get ready for the party tricks Mm-hmm Is anybody listening? Real Iowa, Brother Dawa Bang Israel, that's who I am. I'm your host, and we have a uh, very distinguished guest, uh, Brother Uma, Dr. Uma Abdullah Johnson. We've been talking about uh, the situation in these schools. That, let's talk. I got a call on the line. Caller, just please hold on. Don't hang up. I want, I want the doc to address something right quick. I want you to talk about this here riddling and this ADHD situation and this, this stuttering with our children. What's going on with that? Okay. The psychotropic drug movement against black boys is the 21st century form of COINTELPRO. The same COINTELPRO that J. Edgar Hoover headed in the 60s, or going from the 20s to the 60s, because he started with the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and didn't stop until he exterminated the Panther movement. But nonetheless, the drug movement comes out of that. It is a movement of social control to prevent the rise of another black messiah. In fact, Back in the 1980s, there was a movement called the Federal Anti-Violence Initiative. If you remember, back in the 80s, there was a lot of attention being given to the uh, 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 allegation that black males had a gene that predisposed us to be violent. In other words, we wasn't violent because of racism. We wasn't violent because of miseducation. We weren't violent because of economic castration. We weren't violent because our fathers were being locked up and killed and taken from us. We was violent because we was born with a gene that made us this way. So because of the outcry from the black community, that movement went underground. It came back as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It came back as conduct disorder. It came back as oppositional defiant disorder. It came back as disruptive behavior disorder. Partly pushed by the federal government, partly pushed by the American Psychiatric and Psychological Association, and partly pushed by the drug companies. One thing we have to understand about these so-called disruptive behavior disorders, they are all social creations. There's nothing scientific about ADHD. There's nothing scientific about conduct disorder. These are diseases 
that our children are diagnosed with when they don't freely accept white supremacy. See, if I can't sit still because the information you've given me, I know is not what my spirit needs, I'm ADHD. If I don't allow you to disrespect me and belittle me in your classroom, I have a conduct disorder. If I refuse to sit still and hear negative information about myself and my ancestors, I have oppositional defiant disorder. These disorders are the outgrowth of a defunct, educational system and the drug companies are making 40 billion dollars a year off of doping black boys with drugs that kill their brain cells mess with heart function mess with their kidneys mess with their liver and brother dawa most of these drugs also affect the development of healthy semen in the boys testicles so if you're giving a black boy ritalin or Adderall, or Cyclert, or Prozac, or Depakote, or Paxil, or any of the other ones, from age of three, or age of five, to the age of 21, when he's ready to get married and have children, many of them won't be able to have children, because the drug erodes their ability to father a child. It all goes back to eugenics. In fact, Ritalin, according to the Drug Enforcement Agency of America, is a Schedule II drug. You know what that means? No. It's just as addictive as crack cocaine. The DEA has Ritalin. Anybody who don't believe me, do your own research. The DEA classifies Ritalin as Schedule II, as addictive as crack. In fact, Ritalin is pharmacologically equivalent to speed. The illegal drug speed and Ritalin have the same chemical structure. Some drugs are legal, some drugs are illegal, but they're all being used to decimate the community. Damn. Man, that's some powerful, powerful knowledge. All y'all out there, make sure that you get in contact with me. You need to get this DVD. As a matter of fact, I got to look at it over and over again to, to try to absorb all the information that the brother is dropping. And this is just like I like it, hot and heavy. This information, I've been trying to give you bits and pieces over the years. I've been telling our people about this homosexuality in these goddamn schools. We have got to develop a program where we pull our children up out of these schools. It, that, that's, that's, there's no other way. They have got to come up out of the education of an oppressor. Damn, the damn oppressor can never educate you to free you. All he's going to educate you to do is to work for him to keep his system going. That's what you have to get. And the sisters, you've got to understand this position. What the cracker is at. He, ain't, he does not want us to liberate ourselves, to be free. He yeah. wants to continue to control us. That's what you have to understand. You can't let your child go sit at a damn daycare center all day while you run the street or do whatever else you've got to do. You can't do it. You're destroying, you're helping this cracker destroy our seed. Let's call it. Hello, am I on the air? Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, Brother Dawa, uh, I've never met you. I usually email you after every show. Uh, and we've talked on the phone. Right. And this time I decided I wanted to call and talk to you, brother. All right. Brother, this is perhaps the greatest show you have ever done. I hope this show will be on DVD. I hope it will be on YouTube. I hope it will be on Facebook. And I cannot thank the, the doctor over there enough for what you are saying, sir. Thank Man, you... you, you I just can't bring the words together, what you're saying, brother. I mean, it's wonderful. We need truth. And you guys are dropping this truth like an atomic bomb here in this one hour. I want to thank both of y'all so much. And may God bless you for everything you said on this show. Thank you. I'll email you again, brother, Dow, while I let you know who called. All right, brother. I appreciate that. I know who you are. That's the brother I was telling you about okay. that emailed me before mm -hmm. about you. He okay. sent me an email concerning some things that you had said. And That's you the left the information, and I called you. That's oh, how we that hooked up brother. that brother oh, right man. there. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's all the spirit. Most yes. I put people in That's places right. at certain times. It was just meant for us to meet. Yes. yes definitely. We're going to continue to do the work together. Indeed. Brother. Indeed. Okay, uh, next caller. Hello? Go ahead. Go ahead, you on there. Go ahead. I, I, can... want, uh, I want to 
speak about uh, a book that I've been reading. It's called Black Man by Haki Mahubuti. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the thing that's imperative is that I hate to plagiarize, but it's true. This book was written in 1991, and it manifests to this day. Now, as usual, you are right about damn near everything, but check it out. White men do not fear white women. They're partners. White men do not fear black women because they basically use us as the uh, concubine, so to speak. Okay? White men do, do fear black men. However, a white man does not fear a feminine black man. Mm. Okay? Now, it is imperative that you get this DVD out and, and put it out here for the public because, as usual, I will be a purchaser of it. Okay, now I want you to know yeah. that this guest that you have on with you right now, I'm going to leave it like this because you got other callers who have a lot more to say. I'm just giving my opinion. Brother on the panel, men like you deserve nine wives because we need to breed with people like you. We need to put real children out here again, kids that we know are going to have everything they need for this type of world that we live in. Mm. Powerful sister, thank now you. Now you just dropped the bomb. Now you opened up another, uh, another, another window there, another door. That mm. is a fact. That's and I'm gonna say, I said this before. I've did shows like this before. It takes a certain type of man that's gonna have to mix with more than one woman. I know it's a lot of times people don't want to hear that, but at the condition that we're in right now, what you got a lot of brothers in prison. Let's just keep it real now. Mm. A lot of brothers that's going in prison mixing with each other. And they're coming up out of these prisons, brother, and they mix them with our women. Just like you said, mm -hmm. they come out, they get injected with AIDS, and they come out of the prison, and they start mixing with sisters, and they're giving the sisters AIDS. Yes. That's another issue. Now, you've got the homosexuals that's not in prison, all right? Then you've got the brothers out here that's not in prison, not homosexual, but their mentals is all messed up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the pool of men that can create great warriors and leaders in different areas and categories of life, it's very small. Exactly. So if we want to continue the population, you don't have no choice, sister. Yes. You're going to have to decide that you are going to take a male and be with, that's going to be with several females. I'm just sorry. The sister put it out there, and I had to go there. We ain't talking about that, mm -hmm. but we will talk about that later on in another show. If you want to make a comment on sure, that, go ahead. Definitely. She addressed you. Two things. Number one, we already have light-skinned supremacy in the black community. Light skin supremacy is the rule of order for blacks. In other words, white supremacy, which is the parent of light skin supremacy, dictates that those who are of lighter hue must rule those who are of darker hue. That doesn't mean that if you're light skin, you're a light skin supremacist. It just means that many of our light skin brothers and sisters, not most or all, but many, do believe in light skin supremacy. And if you ascribe to light skin supremacy, you also believe in white supremacy because that is where the foundational ideology comes from. So if I'm a light-skinned supremacist and I believe myself to be better than a brother who's darker, I must also, by default, believe that the white man is better than me. But along with light-skinned supremacy, there is a homosexual supremacy that's coming into the black community now. In fact, over the next 10 or 20 years, most black men in public office, most black men who are instructors on the collegiate level, most black men of influence and so-called power will be homosexual. The sister said it best, that the white man does not fear an effeminate black man. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Say that again. Yes, indeed. You're going to see the rule of homosexual supremacy in the black community. In other words, any black man of substance over the next 10 to 20 years must by necessity be a homosexual. If he's not, he will not be allowed to ascend within the power structure. Damn. Because the white man does not fear effeminate or homosexual black men. Because, and for all intents and purposes, the homosexual and effeminate black man is the white man's bitch. Excuse my French. No, no, go ahead. And so we have to understand that. And that also means, that also means that when we raise our boys, we got to raise them as men. And one thing we have to understand, the reason why black women are mistreating the boys is because they are displacing the anger and rage and frustration that they have for the father onto the boy. Uh -huh. 
And so what happens is he becomes, okay, the object of ridicule. She doesn't even know she's doing it unconsciously. But when she looks at him, all she sees is the father who did her wrong. And unfortunately, by mistreating her son, guess what? She keeps the cycle. It perpetuates because now he begins to scorn black women by the way his mother treated him. Right. So the cycle continues. See, the problem with the black community is that we continue the same failing cycles. Every time a new African baby is born, we have a chance to rewrite history. Every time a baby comes out, the problem is we don't raise the baby no differently than we was raised. So if I'm on drugs, now my son on drugs, my grandson on drugs. I'm a homosexual, my son's a homosexual, my great-grandson's a homosexual. Because it takes a lot of willpower and spiritual inclination to change what was done to us. And one of the reasons why black people continue to suffer the same sickness that we've been suffering since the end of slavery is because we are so interested in changing our environment, but we refuse to change ourselves. Every black man and woman has within them a small white man and a small white woman inside of you. We all have it by virtue of the conditioning. And in order for us to become African again, we have to exercise the demon of the enemy. Until we take the white man out of us, we'll never be free. You can take you out of slavery. But if you don't take the slave out of your consciousness, you will always be one. And that's why no matter how often we fight, no matter how often we struggle, we end up with the same milieu. Because although we're fighting the outside, nobody's killing the white man inside. Damn. That's just like I told one of my partners. I said, you know, in the back of our sister's mind is a little white man. And every thought that comes across her mind, or left side, right side of the brain, makes no difference. He had to analyze. In the back of her mind, subconsciously, he's mm -hmm. there analyzing mm -hmm. it. And if it sounds foreign to what she's been brought up on, mm -hmm. she will totally reject it. And mm -hmm. she will reject us, too. Mm -hmm. Just because that thought process in the back of her mind mm -hmm. is bent on slavery and keeping us slave. Indeed. Damn, Indeed. that's deep. Let's call her. Go ahead, call her. Hello, brother. Yes, sir. All right, shalom, shalom. This shalom. is Brother Lyle. All right, brother. The brother, uh, you brothers are doing a wonderful job. It's almost like I can't even really reiterate anything that the brother is saying, Brother Yamar, because you're excellent in terms of the knowledge that you've received. One thing I wanted to touch on is when you talked about the femininity of black men, and I'm looking at your beard. I sport a beard. I'm 6'2", 240 pounds. I've gone consistent job interviews. I keep myself well-groomed. I walk in, and the first thing this Goween says to me, I don't think you're a right fit. And the right fit is based on the fact that my presence, the fact that I have hair, excludes, exudes my masculinity. Mm -hmm. So therefore, he is threatened by my masculinity. And when I looked around this office before I got in, all the men, black, white, were clean-shaven. Same thing in Hollywood. All the men are clean shaven. But if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's scripture in the Old Testament that tells about a black man not barring his beard or the corners or the round of his hair so the Father Yah can know who his people are. Mm -hmm. but it's also an effect of de demasculating, de making men less masculine and becoming more feminine. There was a situation, I won't keep you long, where I went to a job, and, of course, the manager, he was openly going gay. And I said, and he asked me, what, tell me about yourself. And before I found it, before I could use my baritone voice, I was talking in a tenor voice. And it made him more comfortable, but that's not who I am. And it's unfortunate that you have to go to these situations and you have to take your identity off of yourself in order to be a part of this beastly system. Mm. But I commend you. I enjoy what you're saying because I try to educate like yourself, educating people that is not what it seems. Every time you look on TV, now all you see is a black woman with a white man. Mm -hmm. It's a subliminal process that a lot of men and women refuse to look at. TV has been subliminal to the point of saying that Moses was a white man, uh, Cleopatra was a white woman, all through the beginning of time, because we know who controls TV. Right. And through TV, 
TV. They constantly control our mind. Right. I don't have anything about uh, issue with sports, but all of these things are designed to keep you from looking at history, to keep you from seeking knowledge. You know, most people I know, all they know is to talk sports. Have you seen this person? Do you know who's traded? You need to get in that book and learn how to decode that book and learn how to decode your mind so you can focus on who you are and not give in to the powers that be. Many right. people say, well, are you African-American? No, I'm an Israelite, brother. I, everybody has given me these titles. I haven't given myself the title, mm. but you must take on the title that the Father has bestowed upon you or the Most High. But, brother, keep doing what you're doing. And I was sharing. I called and made a few people aware that you was on. I was even called and made, uh, made aware that you were on. Appreciate and that. I can't say it no better than you're saying it. Keep the work, keep hope alive, and shalom and shalom to you, brothers. All right, shalom, Thank you. brother, shalom. One thing we got to understand about white supremacy, the power comes from making it look like their rule is the natural order of things. Let me say that again. The strength of white supremacy is that they're able to make everybody believe that it is nature's order for them to rule. And as a result of that, they have convinced black people that it is natural for us not to rule. The reason why we have such a difficult time getting educated, finding jobs, holding jobs, is because we're trying to be successful in a system that is designed for your failure. You can't get water out of a rock, and you're not going to get black success out of white supremacy. Now, the contradiction in all of this is the fact that black people annually gross over $850 billion a year. We're the 10th richest group on the face of the earth. We don't own anything but the cash. We're the 10th richest group on the face of the earth. We are the richest black group on the globe. There is no group of blacks, black people in America, although we are only 40 million strong, gross more cash than any independent black nation on the face of the earth. The problem is we use all of our residual and disposable income to have fun, to keep my hair done, to get a nice car, to buy a bigger house, to wear nice clothes. We act like overgrown children who take their allowance and run to the candy store. And the reason why we do that is because slavery has taught us that we will forever be the children of white people, so we will allow our slave master to take care of the important decisions, and we will use our income to have fun. Churches get $3 billion every Sunday. $3 billion goes into the church tray every Sunday in America. With that type of money, you could be building 10 comprehensive high schools every month. 10 comprehensive high schools every month. There's no reason for a single black child in America to have to go to a defunct public school. There's no reason why black men don't have jobs. We have the economic ability to create an independent reality. Indians from India do it. Chinese do it. Even the Arabs do it. Every ethnic group in America, including Hispanics, have an independent reality except Negroes. Why? Because we are scared of white people and we hate ourselves. Until we deal with the self-hatred that exists within the black community, we'll never be whole. The reason why we don't have black businesses is because two black people coming together will not trust each other. Psychologically, unconsciously, I assume you're going to rip me off. You assume I'm going to rip you off. So the minute something goes wrong, as it always will in any business, we part company. You know why? Because we've been conditioned, conditioned not to trust our brother. Exactly. Right. We've got a few minutes left on the line. I want you to put up this brother's contact information so, that, so people can contact this brother personally if they want to talk to this brother. The brother's available for lectures at different churches or different types of functions that you may have. Y'all can meet him today and come out. Uh, to this uh, thing that we're going to be having. The brother going to be doing a free screening for the young black boys. Bring the children out. Sisters come out. Bring your babies. Brothers come out. Support your, your, your babies and your lady. We got to get this thing together. Revolution is the only answer. There ain't no other answer. We got to revolutionize. All this talking about trying to integrate and all. We got to cut that out. We got to separate completely from this European and detox ourselves, detox our damn mind so we can get on the right path. Now I want you to put my information up there so people can contact me too. We get ready to go out and I want you to let the callers go ahead and speak. Peace. Go ahead, brother. 
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. My Two brother, minutes. man, I just want to. Can you hear me? I, I was on the. Uh, I was turned on the tube and hear two brothers speak with such passion and strength, man. I was drawn to you. Off to a plane. Um, I don't want to. Uh, take too much time. What I would like to do is just get the information with this brother, man, because I'm a father of three boys myself and uh, a family of a nation and, and connect to some of this life source, man, so I can leave some for my legacy to yet position myself to do some work that needs to be done. I'm tired of talking. I'm with, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm tired of talking, too. Now it's time to start acting. And I don't care who's looking. I know white folks is looking and CIA, FBI. I'm not even worried about that because if you're not ready, at some point to give your life for your children. You don't need to live no damn way. And at this point in time, I'm ready to do what needs to be done. So I'm talking to the nation. I ain't talking about the nation Islam. You know what I mean when I say nation. You young brothers out there that they call urban terrorists that are not, I want to contact, I want you to contact me. We can get together with this brother. Other brothers with like mine. We're going to do this. Because I'm going right. to tell you one thing. They can't take us all out. They can't do it. But revolution is, there ain't no other solution. Any more callers on the line? Hello? Go ahead, sister. Got about one minute. Okay, brother. I appreciate you letting me get on, so I'm going to try to make it short. I just got a question, if you can answer it right quick. Why are we hated so much? I always wanted to know that. Point blank. I'll let the brother carry it out. African people are hated because historically you have succeeded the world in every area. Everyone knows who we are except ourselves. Every science, every discipline was created by African people. But not only that, Africa is the richest piece of land on the face of the earth. It is the only continent that can be totally self-sustent without any outside help. So the reason you are hated is because everyone knows your potential because they know your history except you. And once we finally come into a knowledge of ourselves and go back to where God originally put us at everybody else will naturally become subservient to African people you are God's first people and as a result of that you are God's chosen people and until you realize that you will never be free mm. did you hear that sis did you hear that all right now y'all make sure you come on out and put my contact info up there so people can contact me we need to link up and continue to link up with brothers like this here because this is it man if we don't do this now ain't gonna be no damn future that's right you know, it's, that will not be a future for our generation. It's, it's going to be over with because of the one thing, and that's that homosexual movement. And it is a movement that will continue and continue and continue until it's just in every nook and cranny, in every household. That's it's right. going to be the way of life. They don't want to just be accepted. Mm -hmm. They want all of us to participate in this type of uh, act, this type of sex act, this type of sex act. And it's going to destroy us if we do not do something about it today. I'm not talking about tomorrow. You don't That's have right. time to wait. We don't have time. We don't have time to wait. Got to pool our resources together. People get ready because you're going to start having to live with each other. All this damn animosity you've been having with each other. Sisters, y'all going to have to drop all of that. Brothers, egos, you got to drop all that. Hey, we're going to have to get this thing together. This is it. I want to thank you, brother, for coming thank on. Thank you, brother. It's it, been man. a pleasure. We're make it happen. Yes.